ridiculous conversion and from rabid anti-Christian became the first and greatest Christian missionary. In all... Well, that's the opening of the first program in a series of six called Missionaries, which were uh, transmitted by the BBC, I think, in, yes, in 1990. It's, I've just been thinking about how this series actually got on the air. It was my idea, um, because I suddenly realised about 25 years ago that the BBC had never done a series or a substantial series about missionaries. Although they have been and still are, and certainly were then, incredibly important. And when you think about the influence of Christian missionaries, of Muslim missionaries, in fact missionaries of all denominations through history, then they have been incredibly important in, uh, in spreading not only, of course, their faith, but their culture as well. Just think of the Muslim faith being taken to Spain. And so I thought, well, let's do something about missionaries. And of course, uh, you couldn't do the whole lot, so we decided to do Christian missionaries. And, um, yeah, I, I think you'll find it interesting, controversial. You may not agree with all of it. A country of bona fide cannibals and genuine savages, where the pioneer missionary and explorer truly carries his life in his hand. A land of splendid mountains, magnificent forests and mighty rivers. But to us, a land of heathen darkness, cruelty, cannibalism and death. We were going to plant the gospel standard on this, the largest island in the world, and win it for Christ. And as the gospel had worked such marvels in other parts of the world, we felt sure that it could not fail in this home of the Papuan and cannibal tribes. The gospel marvels did not save the life of James Chalmers, the missionary who wrote those words. In 1901, he and his party met the classic fate. They were killed and eaten by cannibals. But martyrdom often strengthens missionary zeal. And here in the Pacific island of New Guinea were millions of pagan tribal people. Battling among themselves for this rich harvest of souls has occupied the missionaries ever since. Brother, how are you? Oh, just fine this evening, Bishop. Since the days when James Chalmers was consumed by cannibals, the missionaries have used every development in communications technology to win advantage over each other and to impose their beliefs on this forbidding and inaccessible land. <laughs> Once the physical barriers had been overcome and the people of New Guinea were no longer protected by their isolation, then came the missionaries' chance to attack the cultural obstacles in their path. And formidable obstacles they seemed to be, hundreds of tribes, hundreds of languages. For anthropologists, New Guinea was a great living laboratory of primitive customs and beliefs, something to be protected. But the missionaries saw it differently. For them, the old ways were the ways of the enemy. Even today, missionaries scour the deepest recesses of the forests to find surviving pockets of the unreached and to claim them ahead of their rivals.
Persuading these tribal people to alter their ways has never been easy. Traditionally, they practiced polygamy, and women changed hands on the payment of an agreed number of pigs. From makeshift pulpits, scores of different missions preach different versions of the good news. Whether the alien and difficult Christian message is understood is doubtful, and yet relentlessly they persevere. No country in the world plays host to a larger, more active missionary community than Papua New Guinea. The total population of the country is estimated at only 3,300,000. Yet a modest calculation puts the number of missionaries at 2,300. That's one missionary for every 1,400 Papua New Guineans, the highest ratio anywhere in the world. The impact of such a large, diverse missionary community is hard to describe. They come from over 40 different Western church denominations, all competing for converts and all claiming a corner on the truth. However you look at it, it is a costly, confusing and at times undignified scramble for souls. Missionary heroes risking all to carry the gospel into savage places. This is the romantic image. But missionaries have always carried much more than the gospel. With them go all their western ways, all the cultural bric-a-brac from their distant homelands, all the values and assumptions and loyalties of the western nuclear family. Each mission takes with it a cargo of different ideas, just as hard to jettison as modern conveniences. Stephen and Ridwen Elliot Lockhart and their two young children are moving in with the Yongkom people. Their intention is to translate the Bible when they've learned the language. But top priority is building a family home and a special missionary construction team is hard at work. By the time it's finished, this will be by far the grandest house the village has ever seen. In a state agent's terms, a des res with four bedrooms in an attractive location overlooking the river. It hardly suggests that the Elliot Lockharts will be facing the hardship and sacrifice experienced by their predecessors in the mission field. I think those early pioneers were a breed apart and they, when they came out to this area, or in any part in PNG, they really were remote, isolated. <laughs> We're not first contact missionaries. We're not fearing the cook pot or the arrow that flies by night. We have a very warm welcome when we came here the first time and these are our friends and our brothers and sisters in Christ. So we don't have that con confrontational thing that our early pioneers had. But um, I think in many other ways, the fact that we, we're building our house out here and we, we're trying to relate to the people as closely to them as, as we can manage to go, We'll never get right down to their level, and they don't expect us to. But as far as the actual physical privations and the loneliness, and just being with a tribal people, I think we are pioneers. Is there not, though, a little bit of romance about working in the foreign mission field in a place like this? Oh, definitely. It's beautiful. I'd much rather be here than, than trudging the streets of Birmingham or you know, an open air in the snow, which is what I did before. I get a nice tan here. <laughs> Sal Lofaso, his wife and two small children, have exchanged well-ordered lives in New York City for the uncertainties of a particularly inaccessible mission field. They believe they've been called to take the gospel to a small scattered tribe called the Ningrams. And at present that means a seven hour trek along jungle paths. In fact, the Ningrams have already been evangelized by Catholics. But according to fundamentalists like Sal, that doesn't count. In fact, it gives his task a special urgency. There is a definite urgency simply because we don't know when Jesus Christ will return. We know that he's, he has commanded us and commissioned us to go to every creature to, pre to preach the gospel. 
and we that's why we're here. We're here to give the Ningams an opportunity to, to hear the gospel, to um, hear of Jesus Christ so that they can put their faith in him. There's a definite urgency. If, we were, if it wasn't an urgent task, we wouldn't be here. The physical task is also an urgent one. For Sal and his family, to live among the Ningram people, they must first clear the forest and build an airstrip. And for the Ningrams, the airstrip is the jackpot prize that goes with having their own American missionary. All the material benefits of the missionary presence, all the goods and services eagerly sought by the tribes, are collectively known as cargo. But by accepting missionary cargo, are not the Ningrams accepting profound cultural change? We're not interested, per se, in changing their culture. We're interested in seeing their hearts changed. The Ningram people tend to be idol worshippers. They can worship a skull, they can worship this, or they can worship that. Well, they need to worship the one true God, as he's revealed in Jesus Christ. Well, that's, a, that's part of their culture, to worship an idol. But once they come to Christ, and Christ changes their hearts, they will, these things of idol worship will drop to the wayside. And that's a change. They're, Jesus Christ is changing their hearts and the outward things of worship, worshiping an idol just falls by the wayside. They repent of that, they turn from that as an act of their will to worship the one true God. Well, that's change. And it's these types of changes that we do want to see. We do want to see people leave their sins and leave the things that are, that are not pleasing to God and worship Him and follow Him with all their hearts. And if the culture changes as a result of that, well then, that's just a, you know, an outflow of what's really taking place in the human heart. Among the Konai people, this change is now expressed in solemn ritual. The missionaries have been here longer and have prepared the people for baptism. Whether they understand it or not, they're saying goodbye to their own unique tribal heritage, washed clean of the old life and ready for the new. When a person comes to me and says that they want to become a Christian, I ask them if they really understand why Jesus came and died and rose again. Uh, if they can answer the questions and uh, give us an idea that they understand what the gospel is, then we feel that they're Christians. Man often looks on the outward side, but God only knows the heart. And, you know, we may not fully understand everything, but yet we, they're taking that step of faith and believing. If they hear the gospel, the message of the gospel, and they don't understand it, are they saved? I'm sorry, it's just another mistake. Um, no, not if they don't respond to it personally. It's a personal relationship with Jesus. So if they hear but fail to understand, what happens? Uh, God doesn't really expect us to understand uh, all the, the message and I don't understand at all uh, what, what the Word of God is speaking most of the time uh, but God asks us to take a step of faith and depend on Him completely. What do you believe would be the, will be or would be the fate of these people in eternity if you had not brought the gospel to them? For those that have never heard, then they would be, where man is separated completely from God, and it would be eternity in hell. It's a temptation, of course, to anybody who wants to, to win, as it were, to say, if you don't join us, or if you don't do it this way or that way, you'll go to hell or something. I believe that is contrary to the gospel. I believe that, that our Lord's own teaching in the gospels about judgment is, is figurative teaching. I'm almost as bold as to say that, that, that we aren't judged, but that we judge ourselves by the way we live up to the challenge that God gives to us. And I think it's quite wrong to teach people, more particularly people whose background is fairly simple and elementary, um, that uh, the consequence of this is fear of hell and damnation and all this. And I think amongst people who are prone to great fears, it's not right to play on that. 
This was Bishop David Hand 40 years ago. As a young missionary in Papua New Guinea, he was engaged in genuine first contact evangelism. He trekked into parts of the Central Highlands to preach the gospel where no white face had ever before been seen. He's one of the few remaining missionary explorers of the old school. Like all missionaries, David Hand came to change the people. True, he never threatened them with hellfire if they refused to change. But as he strode across the mountains and established his churches, he could show that his God was all-powerful. For the local gods were never able to stop him. Missionary influence has been considerable, but he believes overstated. Do you say that it is utterly wrong to blame missionaries for the destruction of traditional cultures? Yes, because they would be destroyed anyway by impact with outside influences. Um, furthermore, I think that, well, granted, I'm not going to pretend that early missionaries uh, may have made mistakes, did make mistakes, and were inclined to say anything, quote, native, unquote, it was, 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 was wrong or evil. But with the advent of uh, modern scientific anthropology uh, during this century, and uh, with a greater understanding and a study by what I would say more intelligent missionaries uh, of uh, the anthropological side and, and traditional custom and so on, more and more the churches, I think, have tried to use what is already there in their presenting of their message and so on, and not condemning. There are still, of course, certain groups that do, in fact, condemn traditional custom, dancing, all these things, but by and large the major churches, including mine, have, have, have not taken that line, and less and less taken that line. A noisy greeting for Bishop Hand as he visits a church he long ago helped to establish. Here are old friends who clearly feel no need to abandon tribal dress, quite the reverse. They've put on their Sunday best because the bishop is to celebrate communion. Bishop Hand is busy organizing the centenary of the Anglican church in Papua. Over the years, these older missions have mostly learned to find some value in traditional beliefs and customs. But in other quarters, such tolerance is seen as hopeless compromise, even as treason in the face of the enemy. My leader, Satan, used to rule my life. Satan used to tell me, be afraid of the evil spirits steal another person's possessions. Think, kill that man over there. Steal those things. Steal that food. He was my leader. Before the missionary came, I used to belong to Satan. I used to think it would be good if I would steal that person's food. It would be good if I would gossip about that person. It would be good if I would hate that person. I used to think like that. I used to think it would be good if all cargo were mine. I'm wearing shorts and shirts. Before, when I followed the ways of my ancestors, I dressed like them because the wearing of armbands, leg bands, cane belts, and headdresses was natural to them. And so when I dressed like that, I thought in my heart, I will kill someone. I will cause someone to die. We were of the jungle. We were not people of the village. And it was some of the wildest looking people that I had seen throughout our entire time in Papua New Guinea. And they came down these two canoes and chanting the way the Bisodios do with this, whoop, 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 you know, and coming down these two boatloads. And uh, I can remember walking down the hill and just thinking, Lord, is this really what you want me to bring my wife and two daughters into a situation like this? Because I knew nothing about the people. Go ye into all the world and preach the gospel to every creature, not just those in big cities, but those in remote, primitive, tribal areas. This is the reason that New Tribes Mission is coming to be, and uh, we're out here to teach. The New Tribes Mission supports more than 200 missionaries in Papua New Guinea alone, and many of them are gathered here at mission headquarters in the highlands. New Tribes is rich and powerful and fundamentalist. 
their fundamentalism gives them the most urgent motive for taking the gospel to unreached people, to save them from hell. To reach the lost tribes until the last tribe is the slogan that has propelled this growing band of men and women, mostly American, relentlessly to seek out tribal peoples before it's too late. We believe there's coming a day, and it may be very soon, when Jesus Christ shall return to this earth. Lord, we believe that your coming is near, and we want to be about your business. We want to be fulfilling the Great Commission on the basis of the great claim of Jesus and the authority that he has to give us that commission. Bob Kennell arrived in Papua New Guinea 10 years ago. Even then, very few tribes had escaped the attention of the missionaries. But in the remote Sepik River region, Bob Kennell found one, the Bisorio people. And among them, new tribes constructed a mission compound. This was the base from which Bob Kennell and his partner George Walker set out to save the Bisorio people. If we started like on, um, say you start on Matthew, for example. For Bob and George, a daily jog round the airstrip, their lifeline to the outside world. Using the airstrip, the mission's own airline, Tribal Air, keeps them supplied with rather more than the bare necessities of life. Go ahead. Harry, do you want me to stand by at 4.15? To talk to Georgie. Do you know if he's going to come up today? Oh, he might. He went to the dentist, but he, he should be back from then. So why don't you stand by and buzz me if he's up. Over. OK. OK, um, also, you're doing the coleslaw and the broccoli, right? And I'm doing the rice and the, um, what else? Corn. Over. Yeah, Roger, Roger. Uh... Have you ever done the coleslaw in the blender? Negative. I've heard, heard other people do it, Harriet, but I've never done it myself. Yeah, Roger, no. Do you need any more mayonnaise? Yeah, Roger, Roger. Water beds, washing machines, microwaves, videos and freezers. The missionary families see no reason for unnecessary material sacrifice. Not for new tribes, the frugal jungle life that might bring them closer to the local people, the Bisorio they've come to evangelize. The Bisorio were semi-nomadic and illiterate, with few possessions of any kind. Suddenly into their midst came unimaginable cargo, including Harriet's kitchen. If the Bisorio could please the missionaries, they too might be blessed with some of this bounty. We wanted the white man to come live with us because we thought once he was here with us, we'd have lots of cargo, shirts and pants and things like that. We weren't thinking anything of God's talk. We knew that the other surrounding tribes had whites living with them, and so we thought this would really be good, having whites come live with us too. A lot of people, I think, when they see this place, will be very surprised at how comfortable you have made yourselves. Are you surprised by that? And is it what you expected? <laughs> no, it wasn't what I expected. Uh-uh. No. When I first came, I kind of pictured living in a hut and having an outhouse and stuff. But we do have it very, very nice. And I'm very thankful, too. I mean, it makes the job easier physically to cope with and everything. But if I didn't have it this nice, I'd still be here. But it is nice to have it nice. <laughs> what do you think? Now, is this actually a policy of, of new tribes that you should actually make yourselves as comfortable as possible? I mean, do they think this is the way that you ought to work as a missionary? A policy? Oh, yeah. No, I wouldn't say it was a policy. I think uh, in areas where we might uh, have washing machines or generators and so on, things that might speed up the necessity of just the demands of everyday living. Well, we can cut corners that way. For example, have a washing machine versus going down to the river and spending hours washing your clothes or what have you, so that we can get on to the task at hand, learning the language, learning the culture, being with the people. If we can have modern conveniences that will set us free in those areas, my, that's only going to speed up the task. And what a task it is out of the Stone Age and straight into Bible school for the story of Noah's Ark. In what passes here for biblical costume, George acts out the Bible story. 
He and Bob and their wives are now fluent in the Bisorio language. In fact, they're the only Westerners to speak it, so the only way we could talk to the people was through the missionaries. Many Bisorio have been persuaded to join these Bible classes, to cease their nomadic life and settle near the mission. According to the missionaries, the Bible has set the Bisorio free, liberated them from the fear of evil spirits. But in place of that fear, have not the missionaries introduced the possibility of heaven and the dread of hell? I would say the people, once again, are controlled by a fear of the things that are around them. Um, you ask them now, after our having been here, which would they prefer? Would they prefer the old ways where they're living in deadly fear of all these evil spirits roaming the jungle? Or do they prefer the life that they live now? And now they state, no, we're no longer living in darkness. We're no longer living in fear. But now our lives are liberated. We're walking in light. We've got a hope for the future, which is a hope of eternity, a hope of living with the Lord Jesus Christ. So I state to you that the ones that say that the native people were happy living the way they are, that is absolutely a lie, sir. And if you ask any of the Bisodio people here, they will verify that. Before the missionaries came, we were like wild pigs. But now we are living well like domesticated pigs living comfortably inside the fence. Before they came, we were as though wild pigs outside of a fence, but right now we are living well, like domesticated pigs. Obviously, we believe we've got the truth. We're not going in in arrogance, once again, just for the purpose of trying to change their lives or to make them little Western Christians. We try to work within the framework of their own culture. And the things we share with them uh, yes, there will be changes, but if I believed it was changes that are going to be destructive, we would never come here. But do you accept, Bob, that other people may also believe that they have the truth? Yes, I do. And we do not come in, like, say, to the Bisodio people and say, okay, this part of your culture's got to go, this part has got to go, but instead we share with them the way that we believe. And we state to them, it is entirely 100% up to you, whether you believe it, whether you reject it, whether you choose to hang on to your old beliefs, that is entirely up to the people. But we do present to them what we believe is truth based solely upon the Word of God. But you do say to them, do you not, if you reject this, then you will go to hell. We tell them that we believe definitely that the one who created this world, God, has also created a place called hell. That he cannot stand sin, that he cannot stand unrighteousness because he's a holy God. And as a result of that, yes, there is a place called hell, and for those that do not believe his message, then yes, they will spend eternity there. Why? 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 It's still the story of Noah, but this time a double act, with Bob and George playing all the parts. Incredible though it may seem, over the years, Bob and George have performed the whole of the Old Testament, from the creation onwards. The moral is rammed home. Noah was mocked for building the ark. People awaiting the return of Jesus are also mocked. But they'll be proved right and the rest will go to hell. For the Bissorio, the missionary view of the world is all they have. You believe that you have been sent by God to do yes. this. Every missionary I've met here in Papua New Guinea equally believes sincerely, I think, that he's sent by God. Right. I believe they do believe they're sent by God. Some of them are going just on the basis of good principles. And some, I believe, are going on the basis, truly, of the Word of God. They're going uh, on the principles that we believe are behind the Great Commission, which is making the message of the Lord Jesus Christ known throughout the whole world. So are you saying that even though they believe that they're being sent by God, some are either mistaken, or who are they being sent by? I would say, yes, that some of them are mistaken. I think that once again, according to their, to their beliefs, according to the principles that they believe in, that they're doing the right thing. 
but I believe that their message could be extremely false and that it would not be the Lord Jesus Christ, it would be really the one that was motivating them, but maybe the desire to do good or to be following good principles, if you want to put it in those terms. What I find very hard to understand is why God should permit people who believe that they are sending his message to carry a false message. That cannot be God's work. That cannot be God's doing, can it? No, and I don't believe, once again, that God is behind it. I, don't be I believe there are many false cults, false beliefs throughout the world. And I don't believe that God is by any means behind it. Um, if God is not behind it, I'm bound to ask who is. If God is not behind it, if it is not of the Lord, anything that is not of the Lord is of Satan. So we have to accept the fact that some people may be directed into mission work by Satan. <sighs> yeah, I, no, I, I see where you're coming from. Um, Yes, I, I mean, if you're going to put it in that light, yes. If something is not of God, it is of Satan. According to fundamentalist thinking, very few will be saved. Certainly not the Catholics for the Pope has been identified as the Antichrist. A doctrine that so loftily damns the largest denomination has helped to aggravate long-standing enmity between the missions here. Years ago, there was actual fighting between the different missions. For example, the Catholics would burn down the church of the Methodists, and the Methodists would do the same to the Catholics, burn down the churches without the knowledge or approval of the missionaries themselves, but they themselves took things so seriously. That is years ago. But uh, in the last, especially since the Vatican Council, things have changed considerably. We have a good relationship with the established religions, the main line religions as we call them, but we have trouble still, very much trouble, with the small sects that arise constantly. From the very beginning, Catholics and Protestants competed for souls. When the first Catholics arrived on the shores of Papua, they were refused permission to settle, so they pushed inland into the mountains among hostile tribes. Seventy years ago, the French Sacred Heart Fathers established this mission here at Anongue. They built churches, schools and clinics. By all accounts, it was a little French Catholic colony, with the Fathers as benevolent rulers. And something of that air of paternalism survives today. So far, there are very few indigenous Catholic priests, and the liturgy has made no concessions at all to local art or music or ideas about worship. Somehow, the Mass here at Anongay has preserved the feeling of a French country parish church, even after 70 years. Alleluia, yeah. Alleluia, <coughs> Eva Sango. Now things are changing. Cultural imperialism on the Catholic mission field has been recognized for what it is, and a new generation of missionaries has a new buzzword, inculturation. 
an attempt to embrace those parts of the local culture that are not explicitly anti-Christian and to find more familiar ways of expressing their faith. The results can be surprising. Before today is ended, up to 2,000 people in the Pangia district, the Southern Highlands, will have slaughtered, roasted, and consumed perhaps a hundred pigs. Now, up until a very few years ago, an event of this kind happened rarely, perhaps once in seven years. And then the pigs were killed and the meat was distributed in order to cement alliances between friendly villages or in order to de demonstrate to the enemy their strength and uh, their wealth. Well, today, the event is happening for a very different reason to celebrate the opening of the Church of St. Felix. According to the new thinking, it's perfectly possible to amalgamate Christian worship with these traditional forms of celebration. At the forefront of this movement are the Capuchin Franciscans. We try to study their worship as something positive and we try to see how we could show them that Christianity builds on where you are. So we're not coming in to destroy anything, we're coming in to build. So we said, God did not come in the pocket of the missionary. God was here. He was preparing you for us to bring the gospel. If God had not been here, you would not have accepted us. You would not even have listened to the gospel. And so I think they, they realized that God was always here. And this is, I think this is a, an important thing. And then when we started, the more we started talking about God, they started telling us that they even had a word for this person whom we were calling God. Uh, you know, uh, Akolali was one word, Yeki was another word. And this was sort of the, the top spirit, uh, the guy who's on top of all other spirits. And this was, the, they had a name for this man. Now, they didn't have a very close personal, interpersonal relationship with what we see as, as being religion huh? or yeah. religious. But they still had a knowledge of him. And, uh, and so we built on that, huh? where they were, and tried to bring them closer and deeper into what they had already uh, had grasped. Huh? Bizarre as this procession may be, it's now well within Catholic orthodoxy. Ever since inculturation was sanctioned by the Second Vatican Council, some missionaries have pursued it enthusiastically, wherever it took them. Catholic missionaries are not only the most numerous and longest established in Papua New Guinea, some of them are now the most radical. The Capuchin Franciscans certainly challenge the view that missionaries always destroy local cultures. The bishop dons a magnificent mitre of bird of paradise feathers. A victory for enculturation becomes a setback for conservation. For many missionaries, this most unusual of church dedications would be seen as a dangerous liaison between the sacred and the profane. For the Capuchin Franciscans, it perfectly illustrates the happy amalgamation of the two. There are some missionary groups here in Papua New Guinea who would very much disapprove of this kind of event. Oh yes, um, there are a number in our area here in Pangia. Um, we more or less be fundamentalist groups who, when they entered here, huh, 
had a quite different attitude towards the people, their culture, and their customs than, than say, the Catholic Church or even the Lutheran Church did, you know, when we came. And so they would look askance at, at all this and, and really try to forbid their people to participate in anything like this, you know. On what grounds? Well, I feel that, um, that really, from talking with them and hearing from what they say to the people, um, I would feel that their attitude would be that everything that was here before the missionaries, at least they came, huh, they came, before the gospel came, was evil. And they also, their theology sort of of man, the theology of man would be much different, say, than, uh, than most of the mainline churches, huh, because they would see the human body, I think, as something evil, and so they would be, uh, they would tell the people, if they don't wear European clothes, they're, they're going to go to hell, you know, and and, um, and things like this. Well, that's an entirely different way approach than what we would have, you know. I think for a lot of people in Papua New Guinea, there is a tension between the old ways and, and the New Testament gospel. And uh, for many of these people, they see that you really cannot uh, amalgamate the two. There is, uh, the old ways to them are essentially he heathen, they're pagan, they want to leave it all behind and accept Christianity. So at the other extreme of the argument over culture are the Seventh-day Adventists. As this film makes clear, no mission has a more uncompromising stance on native customs and pastimes. Adventist doctrine discourages all low-down activities, like personal adornment, dancing, drinking, smoking, and eating pork, all popular pastimes in Papua New Guinea. Adventism is full of do's and don'ts. What you can do is plenty of physical exercise. While most missionaries at least pay lip service to the idea that it's important to conserve local cultures, the Adventists don't bother. Theirs unashamedly is the gospel of the clean white button-down shirt, and it's brought them extraordinary success. The Adventists are the fastest growing church in Papua New Guinea. But since 90% of the population already claims to be Christian, they must be enticing members from other churches. Sheep stealing, as it's called, is a notorious fact of life here. Jesus close to the This baptismal ceremony marks not only the admission to the Adventist church, but total rejection of the past. It's a telling image of what missionaries have always attempted the creation of homogenized mankind, the standard missionary product. As an expression of missionary power, it's awesome. And here is a different expression of missionary power. Ukurumpa, the largest mission station in the world. Known locally as Little America, this mission city in the heart of Papua New Guinea is the home of the Wycliffe Bible translators. But much more often, particularly in fast speech, they'll say,
This great concentration of missionary effort is just part of Wycliffe Bible Translator's self-appointed task to translate the Word of God into every known language. Only then, when every man and woman has the chance to read the Gospel in their own tongue, will Jesus Christ return. To accomplish this, Wycliffe has a staff of almost a thousand in Papua New Guinea alone. And even this is insufficient to tackle the island's 696 languages. Despite computers and the best in linguistic software, parts of the Bible are so far available in only one-sixth of New Guinea's languages. Denise Potts and her colleague Dot James have spent the past 25 years translating the New Testament into the Siani language that's spoken by only a few thousand people. They've also written elementary scripture books that they're selling at this country market. In order to learn the language, Dot and Denise took up residence in a remote Siani village. For two single women, that was an adventure. For the people they came to live with, it was incomprehensible. Our director came with us the first time we came to the village and he explained in Pidgin English to the few people who understood Pidgin at that time what we were trying to do. There was one man later who said, I never believed him. He said you'd come and learn our language. I thought no white person's ever going to stick it out and learn our language. He said you'd teach us to read. I thought, ha. But he said after about, we'd been here about five years and he was in one of our first literacy classes. He said, you know, he was really telling the truth. You weren't lying. You really came. You're really teaching me to read. So they didn't all understand completely, but they were very friendly with us. They helped us a lot. Did they think that you might have had other motives for coming? Well, some of them told us afterwards that they thought we came looking for husbands because there weren't enough <laughs> husbands in our own country. <laughs> they probably wondered what in the world we were doing here. How did you actually translate this verse about forgiveness? They seem to have some difficulties there with understanding. Okay, we had a lot of problems with, uh, with just this part. We had to change, actually, the terminology in our last committee meeting, and we'll still have to talk about it some more. They said that if you forgive, it's, if you use this term or the previous term we had, it just means, doesn't mean anything. It wasn't worth considering. But, uh, so we're gonna have to talk about that both in the next committee meeting and also on around your side of the mountain for uh, for how your people react to it. Which means they don't really understand what forgiveness means. Exactly, yeah. The inability to understand the Christian idea of forgiveness suggests that despite the torrent of words, there's still a shortage of meaning. The missionaries have attempted to drag the people of Papua New Guinea through centuries of change in a few decades, through Caxton's printing press and Cranmer's Bible, and into the age of literacy. And they've involved their disciples in their own theological differences and rivalries. What on earth can these villagers make of it all? I think some people are confused. One lady, for instance, came the other day and said, look, my husband has left the denomination we've been going to and gone to another one, and my children are following him, and yet I still feel loyal to my own denomination that I've been baptized in and was in, have been in for a long time. What do I do? What should I do? Would God be mad at me if I left my denomination and followed my family? Or should I stay with my denomination that I still feel loyal to? We just told her to pray about it and that God wouldn't be mad at her whatever decision she made because God understands our confusion. I'm convinced of that. It happens. It happens. In Papua New Guinea, God is credited with some very contradictory views. That, without doubt, he's used to. But what he may find unacceptable are the consequences of importing the theological bickering of Western Christianity into an already divided tribal society. Yeah, yeah, yeah. 